<laughs> I'm excited to be here. I've wanted to come out here ever since I met the Barkers, uh, probably about two years ago. And just to hear all that God has done and is doing here, and just to actually be here and walk in it, and to be in the basement that once had three foot of water in it, yep. and to actually now see it being used to minister unto God's people and to glorify God through it, it's amazing. Um, you know, people kind of will look at us, right, because we started churches with a building. Um, and that's a blessing, it is. But what people don't realize is that with a building comes responsibility, it comes work. Um, I have spent probably 12 hours a day the last week painting and flooring and cleaning and right because you know old buildings have a lot of work that need to be done but you guys have done an amazing job and I believe that God will continue to bless that faithfulness because whatever it is that God has given us if we're good stewards of it if we're faithful with it he will bless and give us more because he knows that he can trust us with more and so that's the same with talents time treasures whatever it is I like being here because uh, Brother Jared's uh, very tall as well, and it's a nice <laughs> size pulpit. I enjoy it. And so um, I'm excited. Pray for me because uh, I, I, I had an idea of where I was going to go um, leading up all through March until yesterday where the Lord said, no, you're not preaching that message. You're preaching this one. I haven't preached this message in over a year, um, but, you know, dealing with the theme of uh, spring cleaning for the soul, uh, cleaning up, getting ready uh, for what the Lord would have for us in this year, right? We kind of go through this season every year. We hit the winter months, and then we kind of got to get back in shape in the spring, get ramped up, not just physically, but also spiritually for the battle that's on out there, right? Because we know that we can't reach anybody from in here. Right. We have to go out and reach them out there. Amen. And so we're going to be in the book of Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to preach with the help of the Lord a message titled, Getting Ready to Go. Getting Ready to Go. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1. <coughs> now the Great Commission, right, what we do, what we exist to do as a church and as born-again believers, as members of that church is to glorify God, right? Now, how we do that is by fulfilling every aspect in every area of the Great Commission. So what are the aspects? Go, right? We got to go out and reach people. What do we do when we go out there? Well, we preach and teach the gospel. And then we baptize those who believe in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we disciple them, right? We have to then take them from where they are and then help with the, with the Holy Spirit but using us, guide them and lead them to where they need to go. Now, now, the four areas of the Great Commission are found in our key verse here tonight, and really the key verse in the book of Acts, and dare I say the key verse of the local New Testament church in verse 8, when the, when, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ said, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Right. The reason why we have been burdened and called to plant churches is because our churches for years have done a really good job of reaching their Jerusalem, as well as having missions conferences and sending missionaries to the uttermost. But we have lost America because we have failed to start churches in Judea and Samaria. And, and, and just think about all the people that have been saved since this church has been here, and where would it be? You know, um, it's very um, very comfortable to be at a church like Lighthouse of Ashton Buell. It's very comfortable to be at a church like Cleveland Baptist. Um, but, but where would we be had, had, had God not called or, or supplied a building and, and rolled up the sleeves to get the work done? Now, the Great Commission was given to every single Christian to be fulfilled through the local church that they are members of. Amen. Now, I'll say that again, right, because the, the, local, the, the Great Commission was given to the local church. But it was given to every single Christian to be fulfilled through the local church that they are members of, right? We don't just go out there, Lone Ranger Christianity. We serve the Lord. We fulfill the Great Commission through the local church Amen. for his honor, for his glory. And so whether that's going into a ministry 
here in your Jerusalem, if this is your Jerusalem, or if you've traveled and you have your own Jerusalem and in your local church that you're from, uh, or possibly even going out into Judea and Samaria as part of a church plant, uh, as people came here uh, from Ashabula to start this church, or people came from Cleveland Baptist or even other areas uh, to start Heritage Baptist Church of Willoughby, uh, or maybe even you're sitting here and the Lord is going to call you to go to the uttermost. Right? Because, again, at the end of the day, that's the end goal. Right? I just think that we missed a step in reaching our Judea and Samaria to send more missionaries to the uttermost. Well, whatever the case may be, we absolutely have to spend this time together tonight at the end of the spring revival of cleaning up your soul, uh, getting ready to go. Getting ready to go out into the battle that awaits us. John chapter 9, verse 4. Our Lord and Savior said, I must, not I should consider, or maybe I'll contemplate it, but I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. We know that here in the United States of America, and in 2024 especially, we are in some dark days. Yeah. I personally believe that the sun has set on America, but we are in the twilight period. You remember when you were a kid and you'd go out playing and your mom would always say, come home, right, when, when, the, when the sun goes down, come home when the streetlights are on, right? But we knew that we had a little bit of extra time. Because when the sun would set, we would have what we would call twilight. We would have a little bit of extra time to stay out there. And I always felt like we were getting away with something by being out there in that twilight. And I'm telling you, brother and sister in Christ, we are in that twilight. We don't have much time left. Right. Uh, it is getting darker and Amen. darker and darker. We, had, we spent this past week getting blasted on social media because we stood uh, in a situation where they were going to have a school board meeting to vote on books uh, that no two-year-old or no second grader should ever have in their sight when in that same school they have no holy bible mm -hmm. right and we stood and just said hey just so you know this is what's going on if you want to go to that that meeting and we got blasted why because the days have come mm -hmm. to where they call good evil and evil good mm -hmm. we don't have much time left we absolutely have to take whatever time we have left and if you're sitting here today and you're a little older don't think for a minute that God is done using you. He has you here for a reason, for a purpose. And don't think for a minute, if you, if, you, if you utter the words, well, the only thing I can do at this point is just pray. Well, you know what? That's absolutely the most important thing of what we need. Because Lighthouse of Rome is here, and Heritage Baptist Church of Willoughby is there, because senior saints have lifted and bathed us and these church plants in prayer. I cannot tell you over and over and over again how God did miracle after miracle uh, in our church's life. And I know it was because of the power of prayer through that. And young people that are sitting here today, do not excuse away, well, I'm young and someday. Listen, you may not get someday. That's you right. may not be 25 That's years right. old and be able to sit behind this pulpit one day. you got to start right now. And wherever you go to school, whatever sports you play, wherever you are is your mission field. The neighbor of friends, they need to hear the gospel because you know what's going to happen one day, sometime soon, the Lord is going to come back and take us up. And at that moment, they're going to go through a very, very, very rough time. And we have to take uh, this opportunity, this twilight we have, to be able to reach whoever we can with the gospel. Romans chapter 13, verse 11 says, And that knowing the time, and we know the time, do we not? We know exactly the time that we're living in. And knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Um, as we sit here, so many churches came out of COVID, and they were just happy to be meeting again, and they forgot that we're here to evangelize the Amen. world. Amen. Right. Well, I'm here to tell you that today is the day that we have to stop. We have to wake up honestly. If it's as churches or as individuals, whatever the case may be, we need to wake up to the nonsense that's going on in our world. And understand, don't hate that person because that person is someone that, that's a soul, that, that's someone's child, that, 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 that Christ died for. Uh, but they have been manipulated and twisted by the devil. And the problem is, was, and always will be sin. And the only solution is, was, and will always be the Savior. And we have to lift him up. But we have to wake up 
out of sleep. It says, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. April 11th, 2011, at 3, 3.30 in the morning, I trusted Christ as my Savior at 31 years old. And I, I, I remember for the longest time, you know, I was the new kid on the block. I was the child in the faith, right? This year, it's going to be 13 years since I was saved. I'm now to the point where that old man, I don't really remember him anymore. I almost feel like we're talking about somebody else, right? And, and, and so as we get to this point, and I say all that to say, for everyone sitting here uh, that is born again, uh, know this. Every night you pillow your head, and then the next day when you wake up, that is one less opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody. Every day we get that much closer to our eternity. So he says, every day is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far set, spent, uh, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. See, the reason why this is so important is because if we are not clean, he cannot and will not use us. Amen. And if you are clean, he can and will use you if you're clean and ready to be used and yielded to the Savior's use, allowing him to use you. Don't give me any excuse. And I say that with all sincerity because I gave all the excuses of why God can never use me, a man that used to do this and that and the other and is insufficient in this area and that area and the other area. Bottom line is the only thing we bring to the table is our availability. Amen. If you just yield your time and talents and treasures to the Lord, he can and will use you. Amen. He used me and he could use each and every one of you. And so, but we have to put off the works and cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask you to be with us now in this time. Holy Spirit, I beg you, have your will and way here. Give me the words to say, and Lord, give us all ears to hear, not from man, Lord, but from you, from your word. Uh, Lord, penetrate our hearts. Help us all to leave here changed, to not only learn, uh, but to live uh, what you've given us here tonight. Uh, Lord, guide and lead us. Help us, Lord, to lift you up. Uh, you said in your word that if I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And Holy Spirit, we ask you, lift up Lord Jesus Christ here today in this place and, and glorify him and draw us closer to him, whether that be for salvation or for surrender or for service or whatever the case may be. Lord, have your will and way here now. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We must get ready to go by point number one, being obedient to the Lord. Point number one, being obedient to the Lord. Now we understand what's going on here, right? The Lord is still with them. He is about to ascend into heaven after being with them for 40 days after the resurrection. Um, and, and these apostles have been through a lot, right? So sometimes don't be so hard on yourself when we trip and stumble. They were with God in the flesh and they did it quite a bit, right? This is not that far removed from them sleeping while he asked them to pray, from them fleeing from him as he was being arrested, for them, as a matter of fact, uh, turning him in and being a traitor on him, right? Um, from, from not being there for him, uh, from Peter saying, I go a fishing. This is not far removed from that. Um, but, but again, if you're sitting here today, and in, even if in the last week you've done something, hey, get that behind you. Make a clean break today and look towards the future. Don't let the devil and yourself guilt you out of serving God. Because at the end of the day, that's just an excuse. Because if he, the promise is that if we confess our sins, he will forgive us and cleanse us from that. So don't bring it up anymore. He's cleansed you from it. He's forgot about it. Just move forward for the mark. But here are these guys. They're actually catching on. And praise the Lord for it. Praise the Lord for a God of second chances. Look at verse 4 in our text, if you would with me, please. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 4 says, And being assembled, or gathered together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. And so, and so what is he telling them? He's getting ready to tell them, hey, stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes, right? Because that is the power, right, uh, that, that is going to drive us. That's why we don't have to be worried about it. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to do the work in and through us if we just yield control over to him. Um, but, but he's telling them to stay here and wait. Now, as we go down to, uh, to verse 10, we see a big thing happening uh, that could have got a lot of us off track. 
And we think about our world and a lot of uh, emotionalism and sensationalism. And a lot of times those things get us off track of going back to the last thing the Lord said to us and being obedient to it. Look at verse 10. It says, And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which, said, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now, they, they, they just got the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was first saved, I really didn't know what happened. Right? I knew there was something different. I knew that sinning wasn't any fun anymore. Right? I, I understood that there's this difference, this burden of conviction of the Holy Spirit. But I really didn't know what it was. And these guys, they, they were with Christ, but they did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They didn't know what they were waiting for. They didn't know what to look for. All of a sudden, the, the Lord ascends into heaven. And then there's two men in white apparel, right, uh, standing there. And they're gazing. Right, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, old and young alike, in the dark days that we're living in, make a pact with God now that you will not just sit and stare up gazing, waiting for him to come back. Amen. Right? We have too much to do. Amen. You know why? Because he died for the sins of the whole world. Amen. And if they would only hear, maybe he could uh, maybe they would come with us when he comes back for us. Right? And so they, they, they're here. Uh, he's, he's ascending into heaven. Now, if you if, if you were anything like me, you probably have some goosebumps, right? You'd probably be a little bit emotional about this. You could see them maybe even considering and thinking that this is it. This was the giving of the Holy Spirit. I got the Holy Ghost tingles, right? And, and, and maybe we're supposed to go out now and be witnesses. But they didn't do that. Look at verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And so they were actually obedient. They actually went back, even after the, the, the bells and whistles. Sometimes Christianity isn't bells and whistles, right? Sometimes it's just simply doing what the Bible tells us to do, right? And that's what they did. They said, hey, the Lord said to go back to Jerusalem, and that's what we're going to do. And they went back to that upper room, and they waited. John chapter 14, verse 21 says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest or make myself known to him. So many people are so confused on what the will of God is for their lives. And I'm telling you, if you are not in the general will of God, if you are not doing the basics of Christianity, God has a wonderful, wonderful plan for you. Amen. He wants to and can and will use you but you have to be doing the basics. Have you been baptized? Have you been saved, right? Have you been baptized? Have you been discipled? Are you a member of the church? Are you tithing? Are you giving to faith promise missions? Are you serving in some sort of ministry? Are you soul winning, right? These are the basics of the faith, the fundamentals of the faith. And, and, and I'm telling you, if you're just faithful with the, with the general will of God, stuff that every born again believer uh, should be doing, he will reveal that specific will to you. Absolutely, right? Uh, uh, 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Right? What does that mean? That means that God's will for mankind is that they would be saved. Amen. Right? That's the general will of God for all mankind. Right? And, and so then beyond that, right, it goes on those things that we had talked about. And then you get into the specific will of exactly what ministry are you doing? Exactly what part of the church do you play? And so if we want to look at a picture of, of, of perfect obedience, then we have to look not at man. Because as great as Paul was, as great as Peter was, as great as Pastor Barker is, they are men and the best of men are men at best. Right? And, and, and man will let us down at some point. But the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect Amen. man, the God man, has never and will never let you down. Amen. And so if we are going to model ourselves after somebody, let us model ourselves after him. Hold your place here and please turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Amen. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, we are going to start reading in verse 5. 
And pay attention because this, this part of this verse is going to come back a little bit later in our sermon. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, the word of God says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We don't want the mind of man. We want the mind of God. Amen. Right? And let this mind be you, that was also in Christ Jesus. So what mind is it? What ought we to be? How does obedience look? Verse 6, who being in the form of God, right, he is God, thought it not robber to be equal with God. Verse 7, but he made himself of no reputation. May I just tell you today, brother and sister in Christ, we are to have no reputation. It's not about us. I used to love in playing sports. I know uh, Pastor Barker is a big sports fan and baseball fan, so I'm sure you guys get a lot of uh, sports references, right? Um, but I used to love the fact that, 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 that people were, that were team players would say, it's not about the name on the back. It's about the name on the front. Right? Why do we serve through the local church? So God gets glorified. What's the church? It's the body of Christ. He's the head. Right? It's the bride of Christ. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about us. It's about him. He, who actually was of a reputation, left the glory and the majesty of heaven and came down here and made himself of no reputation. And so if we want to be in complete obedience, if we want the mind of Christ, we ought to have no reputation. And he took upon himself the form of a servant. The Lord Jesus Christ said that the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve. You look at he was always the one serving. Go read John chapter 13, uh, when he washed the disciples' feet, right? He was always serving. And let me just tell you, it is better to give than to receive, and it is better to serve than be served. Now, we should serve one another, right? Uh, but we always ought to be looking at how we could serve better, how we could, uh, you know, help somebody out. And was made in the likeness of man, verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. There's a big one, right? Listen, guys, outside of the grace of God, we could do nothing. We can't. We can't go soul winning. We can't teach a lesson. We can't preach a message. We can't disciple somebody without the grace of God. And the Bible says that God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Right? Why? Because he gets the glory. Right? And he humbled himself. And I'm telling you, a lot of born-again believers are a little bit too prideful, a little bit too boastful. We were talking about this on the way over. Why is it a lot of second, third, fourth-generation Christians, um, you know, that they really don't do nothing for God? That they, it's, it's almost like they're just checking a box and it's, it's a mockery. Well, I believe they have Christian pride. They got saved young. They didn't get into a lot of stuff. And they kind of like stick their nose up at people that got saved a little bit later in life because some of the scars that we still carry with us. But I'm telling you, if it wasn't for getting saved young, they would be in the exact same position as us, right? And we need to keep ourselves humble so that God can give us the grace we need to use us in the way he wants to use us. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, I used to always preach that he's not asking any of us to die for him uh, in America uh, at this point. But I'm telling you guys, it's getting pretty dark, right? We don't know how far it's going to yeah. go. There, there are people getting killed for the faith in this world as we speak, and it may be at our doorstep. Uh, but I will tell you this one thing, uh, whether that comes or not, uh, he is asking us to live for him. And, 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 and for the one who died for me, I think that's the least that we can do, right? Or as the Bible says, it's our, it's our reasonable Amen. service. Amen. And so being obedient to the Lord, we can go back to our text in Acts chapter 1, and again, I just want to add that if, if you want God to use you, and I think everybody here, there's not one believer that doesn't want God to use them. We just got to get out of our own way. And it starts by being obedient to the Lord, doing what we all need to do. We must also get ready to go by point number two, being of one accord. Point number two, being of one accord. Now, I mentioned it briefly, talking about being of one mind, the mind of Christ. But I'm telling you, as a church family, if you want to keep on seeing God work, you got to be unified. Now, listen, we don't need to be uniform. We don't have to all look alike, act alike, sound alike, or dress alike. But we have to be unified of one mind, the mind of Christ. I am coming to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. Be very mission focused, right? Um, being gracious to one another, humbling ourselves before one another, helping one another, right? Uh, Romans chapter 15, right after Romans 14, you know, talks about our liberty in Christ and agreeing to disagree on things. Says, uh, those that are strong in the faith need to bear the infirmities of those who are weak. Right? Let's be gracious with one another. Let's allow the Holy yeah. Spirit to work. I believe we have quenched the Spirit for many years in our churches because we've tried to manipulate and play the Holy Spirit. Right. 
He's better than we are. Mm -hmm. right? Let's let him work. And if we right. develop a walk and we help somebody else develop a walk, young people, develop a walk with God. Do not allow it to be your parents' walk. Do not let it allow it to be pastor's walk or your teacher's walk. Develop a walk. He loves you. He died for you. He saved you if you're born again. If not, get saved today. Um, but, but serve him and understand what he's done for you and make it personal. Learn how to walk in the spirit and doing the right things. And as a church family, be of one accord, right? God hates, he, he calls, he calls very few things an abomination, but he does call he that soweth discord amongst the brethren an Amen. abomination, right? That doesn't mean that we can't disagree, right? And the Bible gives us clear instructions. If your brother has offended you, go talk to him as a brother, lovingly, caringly. But if there is any ought or any schism in this church family, get it right tonight. Get the spring cleaning, get the broom out, sweep it out of here, and get ready to go. Uh, be of one accord. Now we see these, this group here, they were of one accord. They were unified, they were together. Now let's just take a little sneak peek. Let's, let's go one page, well my Bible's one page, uh, to, to Acts chapter two. Um, not very long from where we are. And we're going to see the result of being one accord as a church family, right? So we know what happens, right? Eventually the Holy Spirit comes, uh, Peter preaches, uh, 3,000 right, are, are more are hearing the gospel. But verse 41 of Acts chapter 2 says, Then they that gladly received his word, they were born again, they were baptized, right? Uh, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They joined the church. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's discipleship and fellowship and in breaking of bread, amen, and in prayers. What was the result of this? Verse 46, and they, the church, continuing daily with one accord, right, of one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They were unified. What was the result of that? Verse 47, praising God or glorifying God, lifting God up to where he belongs, high and lifted up. What was the result of that? And having favor with all the people. Everyone out there that needs to hear the gospel, right, they need to see a unified, joyful Amen. church. If Amen. we're walking around defeated Amen. as Christians, ain't nobody want what we're That's giving, right. right? But if we're together and we're glorifying God, we will earn favor with them. Listen, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care, right? It doesn't matter how much of this book you know. They don't know it, so they don't know if you know it or not. But if they know how much you care about them, then you could get into their lives to where you could open up the word and you could speak with authority to them. It's good, preacher. And, and they, they have favor with all the people. And then what was the result of that? What is our ultimate goal? And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, I, I, I want to live long enough to see this day. I, I got anything to happen probably from one church, but I think if we just work together and we start enough churches, I know I go by a lot of land on the way out here, and I didn't see a lot of churches on the way out here, amen? But what I do know is that if churches are working together and we have churches in enough areas, we can see this. Amen. We had two saved today. Um, I canceled the meeting that we typically have with some of the leaders of the church on um, Thursday because of, of, of all of what we were doing, and I said, why don't you guys just go out canvassing for an hour? Well, it was raining. They prayed. Uh, the rain stopped for about a half an hour, and they went out canvassing. And two teenage boys were walking home from high school, and they stopped and they shared the gospel. And those boys trusted Christ as a Savior today. I believe, to my count, that's about 39 that we've seen saved already this year. I saw that was a mission trip that we took to Baltimore, but still, nonetheless, it's amazing to see that many people getting saved. Um, you know, even though we're in a town of 23,000, but still, it's amazing, right, to see God working like that. But what a, wouldn't that be amazing to see somebody every day, you see, you see a text message or a prayer loop or something coming through about somebody got saved at this church today, somebody got saved at that church today. And I'm telling you, if we're of one accord, we can see God do great things. Uh, two things that you'll see throughout the scriptures in the New Testament with the, dealing with the local church is God blesses the most uh, through unity and through suffering. Anytime persecution came along, blessing the people got saved. Anytime a group was unified, the same, the same thing happens. So what, what do we need to be in unifi uh, unified about or in one accord about? Well, we need to be in one accord in letter A, prayer. In letter A, prayer. Back in, ver in chapter 1, verse, 30, or verse 13, I'm sorry, verse 14 says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. 
right? So we need to be in one accord in prayer. Ephesians 6, 18, still part of the armor of God, says praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We need to be praying for one another. We need to be praying for pastor. We need to lift him up in prayer. We need to bathe him in prayer. Be praying for the soul winners. Be praying for the people that you need to, uh, that you know need to hear the gospel. And be praying that God would send the right person to witness to them. And be praying for that person, that they would not get in the way of God's work in their life. But we need to be a unified of one accord. I'm so excited. Our group is meeting tonight, and we have our midweek service on Thursdays as well for now. And we just started handing out a prayer list, right? Which I'm hoping that everybody will put in their Bible, and every morning we'll be able to one accord praying through the list of the needs of God's people. But we also need to be of one accord in letter B, patience. Letter B, patience. Now, uh, if you go in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, 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 now these men and, and the women that were with them, they had been through so much, and here they are patiently waiting on the Lord. Now, they were in this place for 10 days, right? Um, but they didn't know that it was only going to be 10 days. You ever get like that sometimes where you want to get ahead of God? You want to serve God so much. You want to do something for God so much that, that you don't wait, that you jump into something. And I'm telling you, friend, good is the enemy of great. We do not want to do what we want to do. We want to do what he wants us yeah, to man. do. And it was very hard when I knew God called me to plant a church and start here at his church planting ministry and work with Grand River Baptist and help out there while figuring out exactly where. And I wanted to jump in. I wanted to find the first place that needed a church and just start evangelizing. Yeah. Right? But we had to be patient, right? Because I said, listen, we don't want to plant a church where I want to plant a church. We want to plant a church where God wants us to plant a church. And sometimes we just have to be patient and wait on the Lord. So sometimes what we need to do is have spring cleaning for our soul to get ourselves right, to hear from God, and then go into action. Now, again, they didn't know how long this was going to be, but they went, they waited, and then eventually we know what happens, right? The Holy Spirit came, and then we had the revival that broke out. Isaiah verse 40, verse, or chapter 40, verse 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and faint not. Uh, listen, guys, if, if we jump into something too, too soon, um, it could just be that, 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 that in a 10-day in a span or a two-year span, we get less done than if we just waited, and in a, in a year and a half span, God could do so much more with us just simply being in his will. Sometimes the answer isn't no, it's just not now, right? And whether it comes to being in a ministry or, or starting a new ministry, uh, again, talk to your pastor and just pray about it and take the time. And when God opens that door, then you're ready to go. You've spring cleaned, you're ready to go. You give it all you've got going forward. Uh, we must also get ready to go by point number three, being observant of the word, being observant of the word. Uh, Matthew chapter 23, uh, verse, uh, it says, verse 3, it says, All therefore, whatsoever they bid, you observe. That observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. And so Jesus is telling them to, be, to listen, to observe what the Pharisees are telling them. He says, observe it. What they're telling you is good stuff to do. Observe it and do it. Listen to it and then, and then apply it to your life. Learn it and live it, right? Observe it and do it. Um, but don't do what they're doing, right? And so you could glean young people from doing something, whether it be uh, right or wrong, and say, hey, that's wrong. I'm not doing it. But you know what? This is still right, and I'm going to do this. And so we have to understand that we need to be observant by letter A, acknowledging what the Word says. Acknowledging what the Word says. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read verses 15 through 20 in our text, but this is the part of Scripture where, where, where Peter basically quotes from Zechariah and two different Psalms saying, guys, listen, we're here. Uh, you know, he, he's having some long time to wait for the Holy Spirit. He starts studying the Word of God, right? And now he's, now he's, now he's teaching on it. And he's saying, guys, we have to appoint a, a successor for Judas. Judas has fallen, and, and, and the Scripture is saying that we need to find somebody to take his place. Now, I'm telling you, if right now... 
Pastor locked the door and said, guys, we're not going anywhere, you know, for 10 days. We started, started crawling on the walls, right? And then we were on trying to get out of there, right? But, but at the same time, if you, if you have unity in this place, there is no quicker way to waste unity than if Pastor got up here and said, okay, there's about, you know, 80 of us here tonight. Uh, only one of you can get this, uh, this bill that I'm going to give away at the end of the night, right? Now, now we're all getting a gift right on the way out of here, but, but, but if he said only one was getting it, boy, that's a good way to, 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 to ruin uh, the unity that you have. But here's the thing, guys. We have to acknowledge what the Word says. I am so grateful that somebody lovingly shared with me that a Christian ought not to be drinking, right? Because I had a past where I drank all the way up until I got saved. But I'm grateful for that, right? You know why? Because I had to acknowledge what the Word said. I am so grateful for Pastor Novi, who was just my good old buddy Dan at the time, when I said to him, hey, what does the Bible say about divorce? And he opened the Word, and I read the Word, and I said, according to this, we're still married. Because in God's eyes, well, this is this is this is this is till death do us part. And he said, "Yeah." Well, I am so grateful that he shared that with me. But here's the thing, guys: if I didn't acknowledge what it said, my life wouldn't have changed, right? And we have to acknowledge what the Word says. And if we're serious about spring cleaning to be used fit for the Savior's use, then we have to acknowledge what the Word says. Uh, we also need to be observant by letter B applying what the word says. Uh, so verse 21, uh, it says, Wherefore of these men which have com uh, companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. You know, part of me thinks that Matthias just won the vote because his name was much simpler. This other guy's got like three names, like I just vote for Matthias, right? But, but, but what do they do? They acknowledge what the Word says, and they instantly apply it to their lives. Now again, if I acknowledge what the Word said about drinking or divorce, and then just went on about my life, my life wouldn't have been drastically changed. My children wouldn't have been saved. My grandparent, uh, my grandmother got saved. Aunts, uncles, my mom and dad got saved. Where, where, where would that have been? Had I not, had somebody not been willing to show me what the word said, and had I not been willing to acknowledge it, and then apply it to my life. James chapter 1 verse 22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Philippians chapter 4 verse 9, the Apostle Paul, right, the, the greatest Christian outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, wrote to one of a, a wonderful church that, that, that he was blessed to be a part of starting. He says, those things which ye have both learned, right, you learned them because I taught them to you, and received, you acknowledged them as biblical truth, and heard, and seen in me. You heard of me doing them, and you saw me doing them. Those things, ponder them. Meditate on them. Consider them. He doesn't say that. Not at all. And we ought not to do that either. He says, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. Amen. Go do the same thing I'm doing. There is no, listen guys, there is no difference between the Apostle Paul and you if you're born again. Amen. Right? The ground is level at the cross. Right? The same Holy Spirit that dwells within him dwells within us and can and will use us. Right? Peter says, to them that have like precious faith, and that's us that have been redeemed and are born again. That's why Jesus said that, that he is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. Right? Why? Because we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And to take, acknowledge what the word says, and then apply it to our lives, and go do great things for God while we still can. Amen. And then lastly, we must get ready to go by point number four, being open to the will of the Lord. Being open to the will of the Lord. Verse 24 says, And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. Hey, Lord, you know who it needs to be. Uh, we'll mess it up. You've seen us mess it up for three and a half years. 
Please make this decision for us. You know who it needs to be. How about we get on our face before God and we ask God how to raise our children and where to send our children to school and what, to, uh, what careers to push in our children instead of us trying to do it for them. Right? They knew who to go to. Verse 25, that he may be partaker or may, may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas, by transgression, fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered or added to the eleven apostles. Right? They, they did it immediately, but they yielded. They submitted to the will of God. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we know that when we are in God's will, we have a much higher success rate of being able to reach somebody with the gospel. Uh, hold your place here. Um, uh, we may not come back, but hold it here just in, just in case. Uh, go with me to, to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Uh, we are going to begin reading in verse 11. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. The word of God says, Dearly beloved. He's talking to born-again believers, the brethren, the beloved. Dearly beloved, I beseech you. That means I beg you. As strangers and pilgrims, which is exactly what we are. This place is not our home. Amen. We are strangers. We are just passing through. Yes, our residency, if you are born again, you have a mansion built by the King of Kings and Amen. the Lord of Lords where we will be with him for all of eternity. And so we ought not to worry. We ought to be content with a cottage below. Uh, right? Because, and, and we ought to focus our time and our efforts on serving him. Right. He says, as strangers and pilgrims. Now, the next word does not say use in moderation. It says abstain from, stay away from fleshly lust. Why? What do they do? They war against the soul. Amen. Now, anybody I know who's caught up in sin is too, worry, too busy worried about themselves and getting out of that than they are to go soul winning and read somebody with the gospel. And so think about it. Not only does it war against yourself, but it wars against the souls of mankind because the devil wants to get us off track to destroy our lives and destroy our families and destroy our churches and most importantly to keep us from being out there sharing the gospel. So when we abstain, when we stay away from, when we're clean, right, then we don't have to worry about uh, these, these fleshly lusts that war against the soul. Why? Verse 12, having your conversation, not just the words you say, but the manner of life in which you live, honest among the Gentiles, the unsaved folks, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, if we have them, which they shall behold or observe with care, glorify God in the day of visitation. Which that, what that means is born-again believer, they are watching you. They are observing you with care. And you may be the only Bible they ever read. You may be the only church they ever see. And what this is saying is if we are living right and we are talking right, that when the Holy Spirit convicts them on that day of visitation, they may be brought to remembrance of us of us not taking something from work, uh, even though everybody else is taking, of us not laughing at the joke that we ought to have walked away from. And they may have observed us with care, and in that day of visitation, they may trust the Lord based upon our testimony. That's good. Are we working? Are we clean? Are we living the same way we do in here, out there? It goes on to say, um, verse 13, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with your well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So with well-doing, with doing good, with serving the Lord, we could put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. We must be open-minded while we letter A seek his will. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, or I beg you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. How are we going to do it? By his mercy. 
by his grace. Lean on him. Yoke up with him. He wants to help you do it. And he will help you do it, but you got to yield to him. Right? By the mercy of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Yield it to him. Right? Your members are not your, you know, your, your body is not your own. It was bought with a price. And, and it says, uh, it says to be uh, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable So I love that. It's not, he's not asking us to do anything outlandish. It's our reasonable service, right? And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So if you yield, if you seek, if you're doing the general will of God and you just yield yourself to him to do whatever it is that he wants you to do, then ask him for wisdom. James 1.5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So if you're doing the general will of God and you have yielded to do, I'm seeking your will, I'm going to do whatever you want. Give me wisdom because I want your will in this situation. He will give it to you. And that's a promise on the authority of Scripture. And then what? How do we know that it's God's will? Philippians 4.7 says, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Right? When something seems so crazy to the world, but you're just at total peace, you know that's the good spot. That's when you're in the will of God. Right? Or on the other end, right? When, when, when it seems like, like God's just giving you everything. Oh, what a blessing. You got this promotion, and only not only you can't go soul winning on Saturday, and you just don't have that, that light feeling that, and the pit of your stomach. That's not God's will. That's the devil trying to pull you away. You be faithful to God and trust him. Because I'm telling you, he can give you a much better job with a much bigger raise if we're in his Amen. will. Amen. Right? And just surrendering to him, seeking his will. But just like acknowledging the word and not applying it to our lives or learning it and not living it does no good, seeking his will does no good if we are not willing to be open-minded to let her be surrendered to his will. To surrender to his will. They were willing to do that. They surrendered to his will. Right? Uh, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. We are here like that. Right? We are going to spend eternity in perfection with our Savior. Don't we want to spend the time that we have here living for him to make sure more people can come with us? How does this look? How does the complete surrendered life to Christ look? Galatians 2.20. The Apostle Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen, he's not even going to make you do that on your own. You just yoke up with him. Let him live his life in and through you, and you will be able to surrender and do whatever it is that he's called you to do. And don't for a minute... I think if he's called you to do something that doesn't seem as great as what somebody else is, that it matters one iota. Listen, a pastor of a church of 2,000 is just as important as a pastor of a church of 10, as long as they're in God's will. A uh, pastor of a church is just as important to somebody that faithfully teaches kids Sunday school for 40 years, as long as they're in God's will. Yeah. That's what makes a man or a woman a success. Right. Not money, not fame, none of those things. Just being in his will, living the crucified life. I, 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 once I got saved, I got this little bracket around my, uh, my license plate, and it broke years later, but my, my, my lovely wife found a replacement, and I love it. I loved walking to my truck as a young Christian and seeing this. It said, he died for me. I will live for him. Amen. He died for us. Amen. The least thing I can do is my reasonable service to live for him. Listen, guys, without him, we could do nothing. But listen also, without you, he won't. He doesn't force anybody. When he tells you to go give a gospel tract to someone or go soul winning or get involved in this ministry or that ministry, if you say no, he ain't going to force you to. He's a, he's a gentleman, our God is, right? But if you go, you can see some divine appointments. You see God working in wonderful ways. Without him, we can't. But without us, he won't. So how are we doing tonight? As we close out this evening and this revival, I want to ask us a couple questions. Are we currently obedient to the Lord? Is there any area in this, in just a moment I'm going to pray, and I'm sure Pastor will come for a time of invitation, 
Uh, are we currently obedient to the Lord? Is there an area right now even that the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, you've got to get this out of your life, or you need to get this in your life, right? Because, guys, it is just as much a sin to do wrong as it is to not do right when we know what we ought to be doing. Amen? Amen? And so are we obedient? Are we clean? Have we spring cleaned enough to be uh, ready to go and serve the Lord? Are we obedient to the Lord? Uh, the second question. Are we in one accord in the mind of Christ? Is there any ought? Is there any schism amongst the, 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 the church family here tonight? Listen, don't leave here tonight without getting your right. Somebody might not even know that they've offended you. That's why we go to them and not talk to anybody else, right? Because we have to have, they, they, they deserve the right to hear us out and say, hey, brother, I, I don't know if you meant this, uh, but you said this and it really hurt my feelings. Most of the time it's going to be, I'm so sorry. I didn't even know I said that. I didn't mean that at all. But, but let's leave here in one accord of one mind, the mind of Christ. Are we observant to the word? Are we willing to acknowledge what it says and apply it in our lives? And then lastly, are we open to his will? Listen very carefully on this last part. Young people, are we open to his will no matter what that may mean? No matter where that sends us? No matter what deep waters that gets us in? I love the fact that in... Um, uh, as the Israelites under Joshua's leadership were coming into the promised land, uh, the Lord told them to get in the water, and then he parted the sea. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we just got to get in the water and trust our Lord and Savior to get us to the finish line. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this church. I